Imagine this. You're alone, all alone, in a dark, cold room. The air is stagnant and it smells foul. The only sound you can hear are the voices echoing in your head. And that bitter taste in your mouth tastes like scorched coffee. There are no doors. There are no windows. There's no way out. This is what it often feels like when people are in the throes of depression or suicidal despair. On December 7th, I was going to a party. I had been on maternity leave for a number of months, and that night I was going to go to a party with my students at Regis University, and I was really looking forward to it. And I had the poinsettia on the front seat. I was bringing the ham, so the whole car smelled like clothes. And I even remember what I was wearing, a god-awful 80s Christmas sweater <laughs> and some gingerbread earrings, because I am a child of the 80s. And I even remember what I was thinking. In my boredom, being at home, I had alphabetized my spice rack. And I thought, I have become my mother. <laughs> and I was totally OK with that. And then my mother called. Hey, Mom, what's up? And she said, Sally, pull over. And it was probably just a matter of moments, but it felt like an eternity. I found the, the side of the road, and I pulled over, and I said, Mom, you're killing me. What is it? And she said, our worst fears have been confirmed. Your brother has died of suicide. No, 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 not, not Carson. Not my, my only sibling. All of these memories and emotions flood in. He was my first memory. He was born Christmas Eve. When they, when they brought him home, they told me he was my Christmas present, and I, I really took that seriously, not, not Carson. We had danced together at, at my wedding to Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. No, not Carson, not Carson. Four days before, my brother and I had sat down to have a chat. Myself and several of his friends and family members, we all read this book, The Unquiet Mind, by Kay Redfield Jameson, where she shares this, her own story about living through bipolar condition. And I said, Carson, look, here's this other really accomplished public person who has found her way to recovery. Like, we're going to figure this out together. And he said, but Sally, it's madness. And four days later, he was gone. Now, he's not here for me to ask him what he meant by that comment, but I have a pretty good idea. My brother was a very determined and persevering man, and so I believe in my heart of hearts that he would have persisted to find something to help him through this long, dark night of the soul of this fight against his bipolar condition. I don't believe my brother lost hope that he couldn't get well again. I believe my brother lost hope that he couldn't get his life back again that his business partners wouldn't trust him anymore, that his friends wouldn't look at him funny. And that's the part of the story that makes me so angry. It makes me angry that people who are fighting for their lives with these treatable health conditions have also got to deal with all kinds of discrimination and prejudice, misinformation and myths. I also didn't fully appreciate what he meant by the experience of feeling like you were losing your mind. It was several years later, when I had a perfect storm of life experiences that descended upon me, and I found my mental health circle in the toilet bowl. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I had overwhelming sense of anxiety. I couldn't taste food. I couldn't hear birds chirp. And in the throes of that, all I could do to think to get through it was just work harder. Now, I'm a psychologist. 
I should have known better. I knew facts, I knew theory, I knew treatment. But when I was in the darkness of my own depression, I didn't know how to climb out of it. It wasn't until my father reached out and said, sweetheart, why don't you take some of your own advice and go get some help? And then I showed up at my national conference where I had all these professional roles and all of my colleagues that I disclosed to came to me and said, Sally, you matter just as you are. You don't need to do all this. In some way, I found my way through. Now, my family is not alone in this. About 44,000 people die of suicide each year. That's enough to fill up Wrigley Stadium with another 2,000 people on the outside in a line to get in. About a fifth of, our, of those people are veterans. It's the second leading cause of death for our youth and young adults, from 10 to 39, second leading cause of death. For every person who dies of suicide, let's just say this guy, there are at least, on average, about 115 people exposed to that suicide, and 25 of them will have major life disruptions after that suicide death. Divorce, losing a job, getting kicked out of school, financial ruin. For every suicide death, there are 25 people that survive. 25 people who live through their attempts. They hold the black box. They hold the answers of what it feels like to experience that level of suicidal despair, and more importantly, how to get through it. Many of these people go on to live full lives, full of invigorating and interesting things, and often it's a suicide crisis that's the turning point to help them get back into life. So why don't we know about this about each other? Because most families keep these stories in the closet, full of shame and anger and guilt. And because we don't share our stories, we don't have that fire in the belly, that political will to say something is wrong here. I believe that suicide prevention and mental health promotion are some of the most unaddressed cross-cultural, multi-generational social justice issues of our times. Thank you. What do I mean by social justice? I'm talking about fundamental human rights. The right to have a job, the right to have homes and relationships and be a parent. And it's about our personal responsibility in community for the common good. Well, what am I talking about social justice with suicide prevention and mental health? We must, as my friend Eduardo Vega says, demand dignity now. We must stop with the quick fixes of just pill popping and forced treatment and short hospital stays and treatment that often feels more like punishment than something really helpful. And instead, what if we saw people instead of diagnoses? What if we met people with compassion during their worst days? What if we put more research into the so-called alternative therapies, like peer support, animal-assisted therapy, spiritual practices, and so on? We can do better. So how are we going to do this? Stories. At the heart of all social movements are stories. Stories that go something like this. This is me. This is how my life and other people like mine have been systematically destroyed. And this is how I see that change is possible. Stories are good for the storyteller. Narrative psychologists would tell us that when we place the structure of story over the chaos of our lives, we start to make meaning about it. We start to feel we have ownership and empowerment over what's been happening to us. And when we share our stories in community, we gather people around us because people start to lean in and say, me too. So it's not just good for the storyteller, it's also good for the listener. The listener who feels all kinds of emotions and connection will be much more likely to remember information. And we're much more likely to change attitudes and behaviors because of it. Now, business leaders and politicians have known for a long time that stories are super powerful to change attitudes and behavior. 
But instead of winning our dollars and our votes, we're going to win culture. And we're going to shift the culture from the bias and discrimination we currently have to one of empowerment and dignity, one story at a time. There's also research behind this. Dr. Patrick Corrigan, who studies stigma in mental health, found that it wasn't just good enough to raise awareness by talking about stigma or even talking about mental health conditions. What really shifted stigma was what he called the contact experience. When we had personal relationships with people who were living with mental health conditions, we were far more likely to see the humanity and the similarities than the differences. And that is how we change culture. So I invite you all, because we are all touched by this in some way or another, to join me on a social justice journey, to use your stories, to leverage your stories for systems and cultural change. This is daunting work. So we got to pack a backpack. And in that backpack, we need to prepare ourselves for this journey. We have to ask ourselves, am I really ready? Is this the right time? Am I solid enough in my healing? Have I come through my own suicide, grief, despair? And if I have, have I told my therapist, my sponsor, my peers that I'm doing this, about to engage in this really hard work of cultivating my story? Am I prepared for potential backlash? Maybe some discrimination or prejudice? Am I prepared to weigh the balance of facing that hardship versus paving the way for others behind me so they don't have to feel it so bad? And if there are other people in my story, am I prepared for their reactions? Do I know the safe and effective ways to tell these stories? And with suicide prevention, there are some very specific guidelines because we don't want to increase vulnerability for people to think about suicide and, and do the copycat thing. There's some evidence that shows when we copycat, when we share information that's unsafe, then we increase that vulnerability. So if you're unfamiliar with the safe guidelines on how to talk about suicide, I encourage you to read things like reportingonsuicide.org, or the framework by the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, or visit the webinars and courses by the United Suicide Survivors International. So if you're ready, Let's go. Let's leverage our stories for cultural and systems change. There's many things that we can do. Number one, we can engage the media. We can meet with our journalists and we can say, there are better ways to tell this story. You can do it through an op-ed piece or even a blog. You can engage your state and federal legislators. They want to serve their communities. They need to hear from you that this is an important this is a massively important public health issue. So meet with them, talk with them, and when they have bills that need to be passed, get up there and testify. And then you can also influence other influencers. I'm talking about business leaders, faith leaders, community leaders. You can get there up there at the Rotary meetings, in the Chamber of Commerce meetings, in the school board meetings, and with that shaking mic in your hand, you can say, this is me. This is how my life and other people's like mine have been systematically destroyed. And this is how I see change is possible. Now, there are many heroes on this journey. In fact, a few years ago, I found myself uh, at a, a breast cancer walk. It was a three-day, 60-mile walk, and I signed up for it so that I would get fit. I had just had a child and I wanted to get in this walk to work out regularly. I had no connection to breast cancer, zero. But I showed up for that walk that morning, and there were thousands of other people around me, many women wearing handkerchiefs to cover their hair from loss of chemo. I had people walking with balloons of stars and butterflies honoring those people that had been lost. And when I looked back at those experiences, I thought, the breast cancer movement has a lot to teach us in the suicide prevention and mental health movement. We can walk shoulder to shoulder with people who are fighting for their lives, and we can honor those that we have lost with dignity. Here are a few of my heroes. This is Kevin Hines. Kevin Hines survived a jump from the Golden Gate Bridge. He has gone on to write a number of books, and his BuzzFeed video 
has upwards of 100 million views. This is Desiree Stage. She's also a suicide attempt survivor and a photographer who takes portraits of other suicide attempt survivors, and she has them look directly into the lens of her camera because she wants the viewer to see into the humanity, into the soul, into the resilience of these survivors. This is Lisa Klein, a two-time lost survivor who is an award-winning documentary filmmaker. She's made films on bipolar condition, and her latest film, The S Word, just started screening in September. And it's about opening that closet and sharing stories about suicide attempt, recovery, and healing through suicide grief. And these three are not the only my heroes. There are many, many, many more. Now, to close up this amazing event, I want you to do something with me. Would everybody pull out their phones for me? Hold them in your hand. And when I cue you with a question, I want you to raise your phones up high, okay? Here we go. If you have lost a loved one to suicide, go ahead and light your lights and raise them high. You are shining lights of hope in the darkness. Keep them up. Because when everything goes on and everybody forgets about this issue, you stand there and you hold the flag and you say, my loved one's life mattered. My loved one didn't die in vain. I will continue this fight. Thank you. Put your phones down. If you have ever walked through the long, dark night of the soul yourself, go ahead and raise your lights and hold them high. I'm talking about depression, anxiety, eating disorders, overwhelming stress, OCD. Raise your lights high. Hold them up. You are shining lights of hope in the darkness. Because when other people are struggling, you can say, I don't know exactly what you've been going through, but I may have gone through something similar, and I am here to walk with you. Put your lights down. If you support suicide prevention and mental health promotion of one of the most important social justice issues of our day, if you can fight for this cause, raise your lights and hold them high. Everybody's lights should be up at this point. There you go. Now look around, right? And now hold them up because this is a beautiful thing. And imagine that you are that person in the darkness and you look up and you see a light. Hey, I'm here for you. And then you look up and you see a knife or light. Hey, I have some ideas. I'll walk with you. Bring the lights up. Here's my call to action to you. Be the beacon for people who are struggling and bring other people into this movement. We need everybody here. Illuminate the way for those whose ideas of mental health and suicide prevention are in the dark ages. And if you are struggling, dig into yourself and radiate that resilience. And if you cannot find that resilience in yourself, let your light be held by someone else until you can reclaim it. So be the light or hold the light because light is life. Thank you.